A little while ago, Pyro Ben asked me to look at a video by Gutzik Gibbon. This illustrious young lady appears to have been a postgraduate anthropology student when she produced a set of 12 videos. Her videos claim to bust creation. Pyro Ben sent me the link to this one. Today we are discussing the nature of polystrate fossils, a common geologic phenomenon that is exploited by creationists in order to support a global flood. And we will find that they do no such thing. In fact, you might even say that they preclude young earth creation. Polystrate fossils are fossils that pass through more than one geologic stratum. In geology, these fossils are referred to as upright fossils or T0 assemblies, meaning the term polystrate appears to be of creationist origin. Now, as previously mentioned, creationists love polystrate fossils. How could a tree remain upright for millions of years while sediment slowly builds up around the trunk, preserving it from decay? There is only one way to explain what is seen at this site and other similar sites all around the world. Catastrophism. Even most atheistic geologists will admit that this has to be the case. Creationists also know that these fossils cannot, if their worldview is correct, have been buried in place. A catastrophic global flood could never be so gentle. Thus, they reference the buried logs in Spirit Lake following the Mount St. Helens eruption and suggest that forests were sheared clear in the flood of Noah and then buried later on. This simply must be the case as many of the fossils are cut off near their tops, as if exposed to the rough and tumble conditions of the global flood. What a damning puzzle for deep time. Would it surprise you at all if I told you that this puzzle was solved in 1868? John William Dawson described a classic Carboniferous Age locality at Joggins, Nova Scotia, where there are upright giant lycopod trees up to a few meters tall preserved mainly in river-deposited sandstones. These trees have extensive root systems with delicate rootlets that penetrate into the underlying sediment, which is either a coal seam, i.e. compressed plant material, or intensely rooted sandstone or mudstone, i.e. a soil horizon. Dawson considered and rejected anything but in situ or in place formation for these fossils, and his interpretation is closely similar to current interpretations of sediments deposited on river floodplains today. Dawson's hunch would be shown to be correct with the documentation of stigmaria root complexes preserved with the polystrate fossils. These delicate roots, unbroken and still sprawled in ancient clay, demonstrated that these lycopod trees could not possibly have been transported elsewhere. They were preserved in place. This is already a massive problem for those flood proponents as their oft-used example of Spirit Lake could not accommodate these observations. Fragile roots in and of themselves trounce the idea of a worldwide catastrophic flood having buried these plants, as such a powerful event would tear these minute structures to pieces. Creationists will simply disagree with the presence of these root complexes, however vast and complicated they may be. This is despite extensive documentation in places like Yellowstone. There we find upright fossil trees, except for relatively short stumps, that are rooted in place within the underlying sediments. Typically, the sediments these trees are rooted in have recognizable paleosols as well, and both the root systems and the ancient soils have been extensively documented. Worse yet for these creationists, some of the lycopods exhibit what is known as regenerative growth. Essentially, after burial, the plants managed to continue growing up and out of the sediment until they either died or were overwhelmed by subsequent local floods and accumulating sediments, these trees continued to regenerate by adding height and new roots with each increment of sediment, essentially leaving several meters of the former quote-unquote trunk buried underground as sediments accumulated. This regenerative growth is physically impossible in the context of a global flood, as plants would have been covered by miles of water even if they managed to get out of the sediment they were buried in. 
So how were these fossils buried in place then? Well, the conditions that lead to polystrate fossils are actually very well understood. They are formed by rare to infrequent brief episodes of rapid sedimentation separated by long periods of either slow deposition, non-deposition, or a combination of both. We see these kinds of burials today and have uncovered upright trees in places like the Mississippi River Delta, marshes, extensive flood plains, and more. Annual floods, local volcanic disasters, or even the slow incursion of a coast can and does result in polystrate fossils, the nature of which simply does not bolster creationism, but instead appears to preclude it. Creationists respond to polystrate fossils by simply doubling down that they're excellent evidence for a global flood. And they do this by ignoring the problematic aspects of these fossil phenomena. They ignore the complex, undisturbed root systems that could possibly be in place if a massive global tidal wave smacked into them, shearing them clear. They ignore the regenerative growth that could not occur if these things were covered miles deep in water. And of course, they ignore the fact that we see non-catastrophic local burials of similar structures like trees today. So it seems indeed that polystrate fossils or upright fossils, if we're using legitimate terminology from geology, do indeed preclude young earth creationism. Join me next time, my gentle and of course very modern apes, for another bite-sized bust to some big pseudoscience. Well, we looked at polystrate fossils in episode 32. To me, they look like a bust for long ages and evolution, not for creation. Fossils do not form as Lyle and the Uniformitarians say they form. There are only a few places in the world with the special conditions and the high mineral concentrations which are needed for fossils to form easily. Many observational posts have been built on sea and lake beds. Scientists have watched there for years and not one item has shown any sign of starting to fossilise. Experiments attempting to find out how trees might fossilise show that they need to be subject to high pressure to squeeze out enough water for fossilisation to start. They also need absorbent medium, like sediment, which can carry the water away. Laboratory experiments typically apply pressures equivalent to about a thousand feet of sediment. It appears that if they use lower pressures, rot and decay set in before fossilisation. A catastrophe great enough to carry only half as much sediment as that would need rapidly flowing water thousands of feet deep. And since some of these carboniferous coal deposits cover thousands of square miles, it's looking suspiciously like a worldwide flood. The biggest tsunamis observed today move just a few centimetres of sediment in the oceans and not much more on land. A catastrophe big enough to fossilise trees would certainly wipe out the uniformity principle on which the whole of modern geology and its dating system were built. In fact, the whole world's geological landscape is so full of evidence for catastrophe on a grand scale that Derek Ager, president of the British Geological Association admitted that almost all of the evolution stories have been falsified, that there is a great lack of geological evidence for evolution, and there is a great deal of evidence for catastrophes of immense proportions. Professor Ager proposed the idea of neocatastrophism or new catastrophism which is gradually becoming widely accepted. The idea of neocatastrophism is to explain what the flood of Noah would have produced 
not in one enormous flood, but in several enormous floods, separated by millions of years. This is, of course, a complete denial of Lyell's uniformity principle. And the geology he, and subsequent generations of his disciples, built on it. It wipes out Lyell's timescale of millions of years, which we looked at in episode 24. Neocatastrophism tries to hang on to Lyle's timescale by arbitrarily putting millions of years between catastrophes. But there is no evidence for the erosion or any other geological process which would have taken place in those millions of years. Some of those catastrophes were multi-continental, So if several worldwide floods have to be invoked, why should we believe in them rather than the Bible's one and only flood, especially since it fits the observations far better? But let's get back to Miss Gibbon's story. She points to the Mount St. Helens disaster of 1980. The volcanic explosion resulting in a huge landslide led to a wave over 600 feet high stripping out a million trees, mainly fir trees, and dumping them, with most of their branches and roots broken off, into Spirit Lake. After a few years, some of the trees, particularly the silver firs and the noble firs, some of which had maintained remnants of roots, started sinking root end first, eventually settling upright into the sediments on the bottom of the lake. Nobody claimed that these upright tree trunks would become fossilised. That would need a vast thickness of sediment to squeeze the water out. But it has been pointed out by Miss Gibbon, among others, that the trunks of fossilised trees at Yellowstone Park, mainly hardwoods like sycamore, hickory and walnut, which also have short remnants of roots, are standing upright in a very similar way. Miss Gibbon admits this might be a problem for deep time, but assures us this was solved in 1868 by John William Dawson, who looked at lycopod trees in Canada in carboniferous coal beds. If you read the pages she presents as evidence, you'll see a number of speculations and assumptions about them. Dawson wrote a paper with somewhat more credible speculations in 1882. A hundred years later, Dr. Joachim Shaven made in-depth studies of these extinct lycopod trees, particularly in the carboniferous coal deposits of Europe and England, but also in the beds Dawson examined in Canada. These beds contain large numbers of coal balls, which contain exceptionally well-preserved fossils, which allow precise reconstructions. They show the stems and roots to consist of an outer rind, somewhat like bark, with small central cores or steely, within a hollow space enclosed by the rind. The stigmarian roots have appendices, like root hairs, which break off easily leaving scars or stigmata. They're analogous to roots of some present-day water plants. The lycopod tree roots appear to have intertwined to form matted structures. The hollow stems and roots are sometimes filled with sediment, which appear to have entered from above. But when the stems or roots were flattened, they were not filled with sediment, and the rind and the steely are squashed flat. They probably account for most of the coal. Originally, All of the stems and roots were empty and filled with air. The lycopod trees appear to have formed extensive forests 
floating on the profuse, intertwined, air-filled roots. Like most geologists, schooled in Lyle's uniformitarianism, John William Dawson appears to have had great difficulty in accepting that these trees did not grow in situ. But the sediments on which the trees stand have no biological content except from the lycopod's own roots. The sediments under the trees vary from clay, sandstone and shale to pure limestone. But there's no variation in the form of the trees or the chemical composition of the roots and stems. The stigmarian roots could not have survived in soil. They're designed for water. Dawson, nevertheless, assumed that they grew in place on top of those soft sediments. He took the apparent upward movement of some of the stems as regrowth, not very likely in such catastrophic conditions. It's much more probable that air-filled stems started to float out of the sediment before water and sediment poured into the broken trunk and replaced the air. Most uniformitarian geologists have had just as much of a problem with the evidence as Dawson. Shaven noted a dozen geologists whose papers contradict the possibility of their growing in place, but they can't abandon that idea. Such is the power of the paradigm. To admit allochthony, material being brought from somewhere else, would be to admit the paradigm is refuted. The floating forests themselves appear to have supported a rich variety of fauna and flora, particularly ferns. I was very impressed with Dr. Shaven's reconstructions. After several discussions with him, I wrote a book, Another World, a novel about the pre-flood earth, bringing in some of the evidence which points to an advanced civilization at that time. Floating lycopod forests are a major part of the story. Ah, but I'm straying away from Miss Gibbon. Predictably, as an evolutionist, she has to assert that lycopods must have grown where they are now. She offers as proof the fact that the roots penetrate the underlying sediment. That sediment was laid down, soft and fully saturated with water, just before the floating forest settled onto it. That soft sediment, which they settled into, may be the only thing those roots ever touched besides water. But we can't blame Miss Gibbon too much. She seems to have got her information from that, no doubt, well-intentioned paper of 1868. Miss Gibbon repeats Dawson's claim that fossilization of tree stumps is well understood and is going on in swamps and riverbeds all over the place. What really happens in such situations is that the rotting stumps break down into a spongy mass of gradually decaying material called peat. Apart from a few places like hot mineral springs, trees seem unable to fossilise anywhere outside a laboratory, except in a watery catastrophe on the scale of Noah's flood. Seek him that calleth the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.